getting better. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, Amen. Saint Joseph, Amen. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Very good. So, we could have talked about a lot of things during this week about Archbishop Lefebvre and about the society. Um, I had proposed a lot of different ideas to the priests of what we could talk about, and this is what we came up with, ultimately. Um, and one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about was how close the doctrine of the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ was to Archbishop Lefebvre. So tonight I wanted to sort of, well, a little introduction, um, what the doctrine itself is, a little bit about the enemies of the doctrine, and then sort of the background for Archbishop Lefebvre's love for this doctrine. His seminary formation, the times through which he lived, his missionary zeal for souls, and then, of course, how he passed, what he expects of our society, and why a priestly society, why this doctrine is so important to a priestly society. So last night you spoke about the lex orandi, the, the, the law of praying. So tonight we, we really think about the lex credendi, what we believe. Because these two form the diet of the Catholic, the spiritual diet of a good Catholic, of someone who wants to be a saint. So tonight again we, we look at something that was very close to the heart of Archbishop Lefebvre. He had the faith, he was a man of the faith. And something very close to his heart, just like the Mass was, he saw how integral it was to the Catholic faith and how Vatican II was destroying this idea of Christ's kingship. So we see him come forward to defend vehemently. Just to give us a little introduction to his love for this doctrine, and sometimes when you read his writings or read the things that he said in his sermons, you can really see a, a flame that's there, something that he, he's, he's just on another level when he's speaking because you can tell it's something so deep within his heart, so visceral to him. So a little bit, I'm going to start tonight with a little bit of a, a long quotation of his, but it's words from a sermon that he gave in 1987. 
when he was celebrating the 40th anniversary of his Episcopal consecration. And he had just spent some months in Rome, speaking with Rome, speaking with particularly Cardinal Ratzinger, who was then the prefect for the, car- for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. So I'll read this quote from his sermon in 1987, where he recounts some of those conversations. They have tried, right up to the present, to make us understand that we have to follow the new current. And I repeat it without ceasing, if I follow the current that you yourselves are following, well, I will have the same results. That is to say, your seminaries are closing, your seminaries are being sold, and the priests whom you are forming do not any longer have a priestly spirit. The best proof is that a good number of them, three or four years after their ordination, get married and abandon the priesthood. I do not want to arrive at that situation with my seminarians. I want authentic priests, priests of our Lord Jesus Christ, who believe, who have the faith, and who are ready to suffer for their faith, who are ready to renounce all those worldly habits that have been introduced into the interior of the church and that have invaded even the sacristies and the priesthood. This is where I find myself now at the time of my 40th year as a bishop. Now it happens that in face of these two orientations, which in practice are incompatible, it is what I was saying to Cardinal Ratzinger last July 14th, eminence. You see, it is very hard for us to agree. You are for the lessening of the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the idea that no one speak of it, that silence be kept on it, that in civil society no one speak of the reign of our Lord, so that all religions can be at ease in our society. And so that there will, be, will not be only our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the Catholic religion. We must not insist on this social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that the Jews, the Muslims, the Buddhists, will not be offended by the cross and by the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is your attitude. Well, for us, it's exactly the opposite. We want our Lord Jesus Christ to reign because He is the only God because there is no other God, because when we die and find ourselves in eternity, there will be no other God who will present himself to us than our Lord Jesus Christ, who will be our judge. To solus dominus, to solus altissimus, we sang it again a moment ago in the Gloria. There is no God, no other God. It is not Buddha who will receive us in heaven. It is not Mohammed, it is not Luther. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. He who created us, he who has lived on earth, he who has redeemed us, and he who waits for us in eternity. Therefore we desire that he reign. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. And God God knows knows whether the will of the good Lord is done in heaven. A quick break, I remember him saying, yet hit one other point. You know, you lie when you say thy kingdom come in the our Father. If you're against the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, you lie if you say the Our Father. Anyway, back to his sermon. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is what I teach, I said to the Cardinal. That is what I teach my seminarians, and that is what they have in their hearts. They have only one care, only one desire, which is to make an apostolate for the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in the families, in souls, in society. That Jesus reign everywhere, that is it. And that is why it is indeed difficult for us to agree. Your ecumenism is ruining the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why the book that I have written recently has as its title, They Have Uncrowned Him. They have uncrowned our Lord Jesus Christ, and gives, and this gives the explanation of the situation that we are living in today. He goes on. But on this occasion, it seems that by a particular circumstance, I think perhaps by the entreaties that have been made by certain cardinals, by certain bishops to the Holy Father to say, but now we have to finish with this business of tradition, with this affair of a cone, we have to finish. They are not just the same enemies of the church. We have to profit from these living forces which are found in the priestly society of St. Pius X, the good of the church. You cannot let that go indefinitely because everything is collapsing everywhere. When we see and hear the echoes of the Holy Father's trip to the United States and the situation of the immorality in the United States, which is bewildering, even in Catholic spheres, 
even in the seminaries, is unimaginable, absolutely unimaginable. So where are we going to find the Renaissance of the Church? Not in those seminaries where homosexuality is advocated in the seminaries. So then, what? We have to know where we are going to regain the true essence of the faith and the true virtue of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I think that there is new dialogue that is being set up, and he goes on to speak about dialogue with the society. But he concludes, We want, I would say, to live in heaven a little already. Since we are made to go to heaven, it is indeed necessary for us to prepare ourselves here below. Thus, it is necessary to create this climate of the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we are going to find him when we die, hoping that we will be among the members of the realm of Jesus Christ. That is the whole situation such as it presents itself. So for Archbishop Lefebvre, our Lord Jesus Christ is everything. It was not just, if we're speaking about this doctrine and his love for it, it's not just his attempts to make Christ reign socially. For Archbishop Lefebvre, our Lord reigned in his soul preeminently. His spirituality was a very simple spirituality. It was the spirituality of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospels, of Christ crucified, of the Mass. It all ties in. It all ties together. And again, he said this to to Cardinal Ratzinger. You are working to de-Christianize society and the Church. We are working to Christianize them. For us, our Lord Jesus Christ is everything. He is our life. The Church is our Lord Jesus Christ. The priest is another Christ. The Mass is the triumph of Jesus Christ on the cross. In our seminaries, everything tends towards the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you, you are doing the opposite. You have just wanted to prove to me that our Lord Jesus Christ cannot and must not reign over society. This is the heart of our our founding. And this is why we have the faith. Not just because he saved the Mass, but because he saved the Sana Doctrina, the sound doctrine. He gave us, through the priests, he gave the priests a Thomistic formation in the seminaries. He gives the priests, he lets the priests study the papal magisterium, the papal documents, the magisterium of the church condemning modern errors. And it's thanks to Archbishop Lefebvre. So the doctrine itself the whole idea of our Lord reigning is not an idealism. So many political figures push, promote idealism, their own, their ideologues. They promote their own ideas about things. When we speak of Jesus Christ reigning in society and over hearts, it's not just an idea. It is something that belongs to him by divine right. He must reign, as St. Paul says. Imagine someone coming into your home, taking away your authority, making decisions on your behalf, rearranging the house, telling the kids what to do. This is what mankind has done to our Lord. He has a right to reign over intellects, over hearts, and over society. All of creation belongs to our Lord. And so we say the foundations of this doctrine are that he is king. He is king, first and foremost, by the incarnation. He is God. The second person of the Trinity is God himself. He he possesses the nature of God. And so in becoming man, he alone bridges the gap between man and God between nature and supernature. That's why we call him the pontifex, the bridge. He bridges the gap between man and God by his hypostatic union. And that's why he says to Pilate, as we quoted a few weeks ago, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me through the incarnation. It's the first foundation of the doctrine. The second foundation is he is king by conquest, He spilled his blood for the entire human race. Not just for you, not just for you, not just for me, for the entire human race. This 
to mean we will all uh, profit from that. But he did. He came and shed his blood on Calvary, on the cross. And there, there he conquers us. He becomes king by conquest. And hence, as the liturgy says, which Archbishop Lefebvre quoted this all the time, Regnavit alinio Deus. God reigned from the wood of the cross. This is where our king is. This is our king. The man on the cross. So he's king by conquest. Every soul created by, our, by God is subject to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in those centuries after Constantine, whenever Christ was depicted on the cross, he was depicted often with a crown on his head. Because there he is king. Again, St. Paul, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might hold the primacy, and that through him and through him reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both on earth and in heaven. So as Pius XI says in his encyclical Pos Primas, which instituted the feast of last Sunday, that Christ has to reign over our intellects, as the word of God is the truth, his truth must penetrate our minds. His love must penetrate our wills, the Pope says. He is the law. Just as all natural objects respect the natural law that's in them, they respect gravity, they respect their nature, so we must respect all the laws that our Lord Jesus Christ has taught, especially the new law of charity. And he is king of our whole being, of our families, and of our society. Again, St. Paul, in him we live and move and are. So mystically we say, you know, that God is in se. He is a being by himself, a being, while we are beings of alio, ends of alio. We have our being from him. And so it is an act of injustice for us to say, yes, you can be king over my house, but no, not that over society, not over this business, not over this legislative hall. It all belongs to him. In him we live and move and are. And as Archbishop Lefebvre says, it would be a grave error to say that Christ has no authority, whatever in civil affairs. And so that by virtue of his absolute empire over all creatures committed to him by the Father, all things are in his power. It's true, he, in his lifetime, he didn't, he didn't take this title of king. The apostles, even before he ascends to heaven, he said, now, Lord, you're going to establish the kingdom of Israel. And they don't get it. No, this, that's, not, that's not the kind of kingdom that he, he wanted to establish in his lifetime. As we say again in the liturgy, beautifully speaking to Herod, you know, after, I think it's, I think this is from the Feast of the Epiphany, but non eripit mortalia, qui regna dat celestia. He won't steal your mortal kingdom, he who came to give the celestial one. And yet his authority remains. He does deserve, he does have the right to reign over society. And again, that's why he said to Pilate, you would have no power over me but that were given you from above. Archbishop Lefebvre again, Jesus Christ is therefore the pole of history. History has only one law. He must reign. If he reigns, true progress and prosperity also reign, which are goods more spiritual than material. Well, there are many enemies of this doctrine. These enemies are in favor of an absolute divorce between church and state, a divorce between reason and faith, a divorce between civil authority and ecclesiastical authority. They want anything that smacks of the supernatural to be absolutely destroyed. They ultimately want to ruin the supernatural reign of our Lord Jesus Christ in souls. 
And they tried to get there by destroying his any authority, any semblance of him in society. Even Archbishop of Clev himself talks about these errors began with Luther, with Kant. They wanted this divorce between faith and reason. And so, unfortunately, too, the enemies of Christ the King have even been able to pass into the church, as we well know, as we have perceived. Their ideas have infiltrated the church, have infiltrated churchmen, have infiltrated the Pope themselves, such they've, that they've done the bidding of the enemy of the church. And though we don't give an exhaustive list of the enemies, we can surely call them by name, by certain names. Liberalism, it's a sin. Liberalism is a sin. Those who deny our duty to follow Christ, those who deny that there is any law outside of man himself that we are bound by, who make liberty into an absolute, you are free. No, you are not just free. You are free to pursue the good. And liberals in their supposed tolerance will ultimately lead to totalitarian societies. If you saw that today in France, oh, the France of equality and liberty and all these great things, where today a Catholic woman was beheaded in her Catholic church. What it leads to? Because the enemies of our faith are going to Play, play nicely, like we think they will. Liberalism, communism, those who reject God. They reject God and their atheism. They reject man's liberty to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and other natural rights of man. Naturalism, those who deny any supernatural order that works in harmony with the natural it's like our bishops, not the society bishops, but the bishops in the U.S., for example, during COVID. One of them writing to his faithful, closing down their masses, says, my preeminent duty is to make sh take care of your physical safety. This is naturalism at play. This is a perfect example of naturalism. It's not your duty. Your duty is to save souls. Your first duty is to see to the salvation of souls. Ecumenism and religious liberty as, they, as these principles are manifested in the church. The denial of there being one true church, one true ark of salvation. This religious pluralism that Pope John Paul II, and I certainly didn't say saint, Pope John Paul II promoted religious pluralism as the ideal, as the ideal in which somehow the Catholic faith, faith would flourish. This was precisely condemned by Leo XIII in his encyclical Longin Quociani, condemning Americanism. And materialism. And we can call all kinds of enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we know that, and I think here we have to be careful to not just put names on it, or specific groups of people. Yes, there are groups, like the Freemasons, for example. Yes, they are enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no doubt. But their ideas are what's the most dangerous. Because these ideas ultimately come from Satan. He is the ultimate conspirator. Because in the end, as we know from our Ignatian retreats, it's the standard of our Lord Jesus Christ and the standard of Satan. And all these men... And all these bad ideas are just pawns of the devil in his attempt to overthrow our Lord. This doctrine of the kingship of our Lord for Archbishop Lefebvre is something very dear, as we've said. 
Interestingly enough, when he came to the seminary in Rome, to the French seminary, Santa Chiara, he, he admits later in his life, I remember coming to the seminary with incorrect ideas, which I modified during my studies. For example, I thought it was an excellent that the state was separated from the church. Oh yes, I was a liberal. <laughs> Archbishop himself was a liberal, coming, being soaked as we all are, by the liberal society in which we live. Oh yes, I was a liberal. And this is a hundred years ago. And so the cure, the cure for our dear founder, came from the formation given to him by his rector, Father Lefoc. And his constant efforts to align the seminarians with the spirit of the church and the popes. He used to tell Archbishop Lefebvre and the other seminarians that you must be on crusade for our Lord Jesus Christ. A constant crusade for our Lord Jesus Christ. A crusade for your whole life for our Lord Jesus Christ. So he was formed according to the vision of the popes. And when we go back to those times and we see the papal, papal encyclicals, they were constantly amongst many other beautiful encyclicals and, shall we say, maybe more positive encyclicals, they were constantly condemning the errors of their age, the modern errors. Go back and read the syllabus of error of Pius IX. This is how a pope speaks. Quanta Cura was the encyclical followed up by the syllabus of errors. This is a pope who, Pius IX, when he became pope, they say he was pretty liberal, in fact. And then he had the papal state stolen from him by the enemies of the church. And then he sharpened his sword and started condemning the, the modern errors. Leo XIII, you know he wrote the beautiful encyclical Humanum Genus, con condemning Freemasonry and the naturalism which it seeks, and the naturalism which seeks to destroy the supernatural order. He wrote Libertas Prestantissimum on false liberty. Pius X, our apostolic mandate, a letter to the French bishops decrying an effort to merge socialism with Catholic ideas, the shindy against modernism, the Hementinos, which promoted the, which was an encyclical against the, the, uh, the civil authorities in France who were trying to separate church and state and removing the Concordat of 1801, which still allowed Catholicism to be considered the religion of the state in France. And then even when Archbishop Lefebvre was in the seminary, I wish Pope like, there were popes like this during my seminary formation, but Pius XI during his seminary came out with Plas Primas. That encyclical came out while our dear founder was in the seminary. This encyclical on Christ the King and Divini Redemptoris, which decrees against communism, class struggle, and dialectical materialism. And this is why in our seminaries, Archbishop Lefebvre created a class that we take in our year of spirituality called Acts of the Magisterium, so that we would study in depth the teachings of the popes, that our minds would be formed according to the mind, mind of the church. And amongst these other encyclicals, they often had other readings from the great, the great writers of those days. Father Fehi, Father Deschamps, Father Fekli, uh, Cardinal Bio, Cardinal Key, all who were great promote, proponents of the doctrine of Christ the King. Father Fehi, who himself actually studied at Santa Chiara in Rome, the same seminary, 12 years previous to Archbishop Lefebvre, said that in this fight for our Lord Jesus Christ, our first goal is to recognize and promote the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, and secondly, to unmask those who are the enemies of the doctrine. This is the task, and Archbishop Lefebvre stayed true to that his whole life, unmasking the errors even after Vatican II. Father Fekli, who gave a commentary to the seminarians when Plas Primas came out, According to Archbishop Lefebvre, he says, his talks, which were very simple, taking the words of Scripture, showing who our Lord Jesus Christ was, 
those talks remained with us our whole life. They said they became the object of their meditation, the subject of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we shall never have sufficiently meditated on or sought or understood what our Lord Jesus Christ is. He should rule our thinking. He makes us holy. He is also our creator since nothing whatsoever was made without the word and therefore without our Lord Jesus Christ who is the word. So we must only think about and contemplate our Lord Jesus Christ. And that transforms one's life. Again, here we really start touching the soul of our founder's spirituality, which is not some unique, special spirituality. It's simple. It's Jesus Christ, King of my soul. Jesus Christ, the one who's found in the Gospels. If I just crack open when I'm in front of the Blessed Sacrament and I can contemplate his life, his words, his example. We know our dear founder lived through changing times too. Again, for our founder, this is not an idealism. This is not just an idea. It would be nice because he read some books on, on the kingship of Jesus Christ. He lived through a changing society. He lived as a child through World War I. He remembers trying to get to Mass while German soldiers are you know, afraid of German soldiers as he's trying to sneak, sneak off in the dark to go serve mass early in the morning. He lived through the communist revolutions in Spain. World War II, with the advancing of a neo-paganism of, Nazi, of the Nazis. He lived through this. His father, of course, was killed by them. He lived through post-World War II and the communism that spread through all of Eastern Europe from that, and, and throughout the whole world, in fact. Even the infiltration of communist ideas into the Muslims of Senegal, and their intentions to wage war on Westerners and missionaries. He lived through this. Ideas have consequences. Ideas have effects in real life. He even writes to his priests in 1950, having heard about the imprisonment of Cardinal Menzenti and his pastoral letters here. It's a great book. He writes to his priests, faced with the horrible events taking place in Hungary, Romania, Siberia, and China, and with the impiety and the hatred of God's name, which are their root cause, how can we as Christians fail to be deeply dismayed Never a day goes by without news of massacres and deportations of all those good people who by word or action have shown their dedication to God and their fellow man. However, the recent imprisonment of Cardinal Menzenti, his trial and the outrageous treatment to which he has been subjected, and now his sentence provide a particularly terrifying illustration of what thousands of human beings have suffered and continue to suffer for having openly defended civilization. No decent man can possibly remain indifferent when faced with such crimes against humanity. And he speaks about this rage of communism throughout the world. And he goes on to tell his priests what to do to respond. The first two things he says is to avenge God's honor by leading a more fervent Christian life. Not activism, live a Christian life. Secondly, to, prayer, to pray and praise. Praise Almighty God and add penance to it. And lastly, thirdly, he says, to establish the kingship of Jesus Christ. To prayer and penance, he says, drawing upon the love of our Lord, we will add an indefatigable zeal for the establishment of his kingdom in civil society and in the family. No man of common sense and goodwill, seeing the ills which afflict us, and which are particularly prevalent in certain countries, will take long to realize that the source of these calamities lies in neglect an official denial of God by whole societies, and often even at the family level. The family level. Our Holy Father the Pope, who at this time is Pius XII, said only recently that once God has been abolished, disdain for the things of God turns man, stripped of his spiritual dignity, into the base slave of things material, suppressing and even uprooting all the beauty shown forth in virtue 
love, hope, and the interior life. No civil society will ever be able to survive by banishing God, for the sacred principles of religion alone can justly balance the rights and duties of citizens, consolidate the foundations of the state, and regulate the actions of men by salutary laws, directing them in an orderly fashion towards virtue. And then lastly, in, in the same letter, we get a little hint of, the, again, the connection between his love for this doctrine and the priesthood. I will close, he says to his priest, by passing on to you a special request from the Holy Father, which is as follows. Although atheism and the hatred of God constitute a monstrous sin which defiles our century and rightly causes it to fear terrible punishments, yet the blood of Christ and the chalice of the new covenant is a fount of purification, thanks to which we can wash away this loathsome crime. And having besought pardon for the guilty, can obliterate its consequences and prepare for the church a, ma a magnificent triumph. What's, what's going to fix it all? The sacrifice of the Mass, the priesthood, and the Mass, and living a Christian life. He saw at Vatican II, you know he was on the preparatory commission, he helped prepare the, the, the schemas for Vatican II, the ones that were all thrown out the window at Vatican II. He helped Cardinal Lataviani prepare this schema on the relationship between the church and the state. Cardinal Taviani, it's in the back of, they've uncrowned them, this, this schema. It's beautiful, it's clear. And he, he referenced all the previous magisterium, and he saw that document thrown out the window and the new one come in, which made no reference whatsoever to previous magisterium. He saw, actually, the disintegration of Catholic nations. Nations that had in their constitutions provisions for the rights of the church. And not just, not even that, not even that protecting the rights of the church, but saying that the Catholic church has, is the religion of this country. He saw these kinds of countries fall. Because of the declaration of Vatican II of Dignitatis Humanae, In Ireland, Archbishop Lefebvre was indignant. They suppressed this expression from their constitution. Special position of the Holy Catholic Apostolic and Roman Church as the guardian of the faith professed by the majority of its citizens. And it was replaced with this phrase, the homage of public worship given by the state to Almighty God. In Italy, again, the he saw the, the bishop, the Archbishop of Milan specifically, say that the state can only but be secular. This is in 1977. The, this Archbishop says the church doesn't ask for privileges, but only for genuine freedom. In the current historical development of society, a confessional state, one in which the Catholic faith is, is, is accepted, a confessional state is not possible. Not only a confessional Christian state, but also a confessional Marxist, atheistic state, or a confessional radical bourgeois state. We are calling for a state that does not embrace any particular ideology. He calls the faith an ideology. Unbelievable. That does not impose the dogmas of any culture, and that does not identify with any party. Otherwise, very many of its citizens, because of their religious or ideological or partisan choices, would be compelled to feel like strangers in their own land. Again, this is what our dear founder lived through. Putting the faith on par with Marxist ideologies. What a horrible evolution he, he lived through. And he went on to say that the goal of the secularization of the state is the goal of the devil and the Freemasonry. The destruction of the church by affording false religions, freedom of speech, and forbidding the state to work for the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. He lived through this. He lived through Assisi, all, all the meetings of Assisi. He lived through priests leaving their priesthood in mass, and the same with religious, men and women. He lived through the scandals of the popes, 
kissing the, the Koran like John Paul II did. It was not, not as one of our, our college students wrote a few years ago, um, proof of ecumenism in the church is that all the popes have kissed the Korean. Um, <laughs> kissing Koreans isn't proof of ecumenism. Um, no, kissing the Koran. He lived through all this. Imagine if he had to hear today the, the ecology that's promoted by the Pope. The Pope seemingly being in favor of civil unions of homosexuals, as he said recently. Well, he lived through all of that and in giving us a society which, as Father Reed explained to you, its main purpose is the priesthood. In fact, as he says, the purpose of the society is the priesthood and only the priesthood and everything that comes from the priesthood. So how does a society like that realize this kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ? Primarily through the sacred mass, the liturgy and the priesthood. It is the mass daily that asserts the spiritual kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. He reigns from the cross. This is our king, our leader, the one who we have to follow. He's crucified. He purchased us with his blood. Ruling from the cross, he claims dominion over our souls primarily through the Mass. Ignavit alinio Deus. It's precisely why we bring our Eucharistic King in procession, when we can, in procession through the streets to show all, you know, him whose yoke is sweet and whose burden is light. Christ reigns through the priesthood, a true priesthood. A priesthood where the priest isn't just this, this president over a mass, president over a community. No, a, a real priest who is a man of sacrifice who preaches Jesus Christ crucified and him alone. Not a man who offers a supper, not a leader of a pep rally. And this is again why I said earlier he, Archbishop of Heaven, insisted in our seminaries to, to teach us the true faith, to put our minds in conformity with the the teachings of the popes. You know, in the fraternity of St. Peter, they don't teach Acts of the Magisterium. They don't learn about the crisis in the church. They just have, as they say, the charism of the old mass. That's not going to restore things. That's not going to promote the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, our Archbishop Lefeb says, to win this battle back, to promote the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, above all, we need the Mass. We need the Mass as the center of our Catholic lives, uniting ourselves to our King in the sacrifice of the altar. But he also says we need to form an elite of Catholics, secondarily. An elite of Catholics. Those who are imbued profoundly with the spiritual spirituality of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which you can do in so many different ways, especially the society's third order, or through some of these other sodalities. To practice an interior life regularly. To, you know, stop reading these, these sentimental books, these pink devotional books. Throw those away. The, the ones that are usually bound and are printed and with uh, some kind of sentimental picture on the front. Stop reading the, you know, the mystics of the 16th century or whatever. I'm not saying stop altogether, but read Don Marmion. Read Gary de Lagrange. These are the, the authors who, who fed the soul of our dear founder. Because what they teach in their spiritual writings is nothing but Catholic doctrine. We need to read. You need to read these books, all of them. You know, I remember a few years ago when I was the bursar, we were doing an audit of Angelus Press, 
And one of the things that came up was interesting is the books that sell the least at Angelus Press are the books of Archbishop of Hell. That's sad, but it's true. You need to read these books, pastoral letters. They've unpound him against the heresies. I mean, these books are pure doctrine. And they're not, they're very approachable. They're very approachable. We need to have this mind of our Christian club, again, not because we follow some unique, special man who, you know, was, who started some schism. No, he has the mind of the church. His soul is imbued with the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is his spirituality, his teachings, are the teachings of the faith, nothing more, nothing less. You gotta read these things. If you haven't already, read them again. Because they'll help us to be that elite of the Catholic Church. And ultimately, as Archbishop Lefebvre says, the third thing we need to do to restore the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ after the Mass and forming an elite is to recrown our Lord Jesus Christ openly in Catholic civil organizations. To do what we can to make our Lord reign in society, starting with your homes. You haven't enthroned Jesus Christ in your home, the Sacred Heart in your home, it's a good way to start. Father Matteo, I did a time with Father on that, you can look that up on YouTube, um, in our assumption, our assumption thing, in our assumption channel. Start in your homes, but we know we can do more, and we, we do do more. We consecrate our town and our district to Our Lady. We're putting, we're trying little by little to restore these things to Almighty God, even through our young adult groups all across the country, and the MJCF in France. We try to make our Lord Jesus Christ reign in society. But ultimately we know we're, we're not going to solve the problem just by electing the right people. It's a battle over hearts, as I said a few weeks ago. It's a battle over hearts. Unless we can have conversions to the faith, teach men the faith, Give them a good example of what it means to be a Catholic. Make them love the faith by loving what we are. We'll never see this reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the goal of the society. And again, just to sum it all up, commenting on St. Pius X's first encyclical, A Supremi Apostolatus, Archbishop Lefebvre makes clear that the program of his pontificate is the program of our society, instaurare omnia in Christo, to restore all things in Jesus Christ. This is the program of the society, he says. There's no other way to bring back men to God than by Jesus Christ. No foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And that's precisely why our founder named the society after St. Pius X. Because he was for the priesthood. He was for the sanctification of priests more than anything and the restoration of all things in Christ. And of course, it was stemmed ultimately, his love for this doctrine stemmed from his love for souls, his missionary heart. He knew that souls would be lost unless our Lord reigned in society and his laws were respected. There is no one else in whom we can be saved. As he said, we're not going to go to heaven and find Buddha judging us. It'll be Jesus Christ, not Luther, it's Jesus Christ. Again, just a little effort to present to you a little bit of the heart of our dear founder and encourage you to make this doctrine your own, through your spirituality and through your, the doctrine that you read and study, which you should be doing on a regular basis. All right, tonight, instead of praying the rosary in here, We'll go over to the chapel where the Blessed Sacrament is exposed. It's been a day of perpetual adoration. And we will um, we'll have the rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament and then reposition of the Blessed Sacrament. So we'll say a prayer and then and we'll head over to the chapel if, if you can. So. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. St. Pius X. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for coming.
Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Gloria. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, 
I full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Gloria. Joyful mystery is a presentation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
us. All right, beloved, as glorious be, blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, save us from the sins of the world. Amen. Gloria. Pray for us, the Holy Mother of God, that we may be in the of Let us pray, O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal life. Grant, we beseech thee that by meditating upon these mysteries of the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, 
we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. With the intention of building the home worthy of the Immaculata, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that in every blessed the Lord, with every one who will thy protection, implore thy help or stop thy intercession and stop the way. Inspired by this confidence, I fly into the O Virgin Mary, and to thee I come before thee, I stand. Michael the Archangel, the architecture made to do this and stand to the devil. May God rebuke you in your holy prayer, and do thou offer the step in the name of the power of God. Cast into hell Satan all the evil spirits, who prowl out of the world so to be the souls of the Lord. To thee, O blessed Joseph, to be the report of the star of the and I'm having a Lord that all thy price will be spouse. We now in our time of confidence, and the super he also takes us under that charity will be the most united to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God. And by that brotherly love, which thou didst generate to thy Jesus, we beseech thee, we hope and pray, that thou would look down with gracious eyes upon thy inheritance, which Jesus Christ purchased by his blood, and is the sister of our needs by thy power and strength. That then the most beautiful party of the Holy Family, and to the offspring of Jesus Christ, he from us the most loving Father, all thy prayer.
and reparation for blasphemy. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Ghost, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God and his angels and in his saints. Blessed be God and 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 his saints. Blessed be God and